So the structure of a brokerage is the broker and the salespeople. An associate broker just means maybe they just took their, they got their brokerage license. That by itself doesn't inform me as to the relationship as it has to do with you as an agent. So you need to know if this, who handles the administrative details of their deals? Do they outsource it to a transaction coordinator? Do they have marketing support? Or are they, are they entering their listings online? Are they doing all the emails back and forth? Because half of our job as agents is administrative. And if you don't have somebody else doing it, then you're doing it. And if you have an agent who's doing everything by themselves, it's gonna be really hard to form a viable partnership when they don't even have that off their plate yet. One thing I wanna point out here, so the MREA book itself is like a Frankenstein of best practices. It's not meant to be followed 100% as written, it's just what successful agents have done. But I did wanna point out that when you read it, it makes it sound as if everybody should be the CEO of the business. And I don't feel like it gives enough room or permission for people to read it and say, hey, that's not me. I wanna be this person, you know? And, and as you see it here, there's so many roles that we can play in real estate. It has room for a lot of different talents. So I just wanna give you permission, if you feel the need to have permission, to not be the CEO, not be the rainmaker of the team, because that's where I found myself at one year. And it was a huge sacrifice to my ego <laughs> to be like, all right, I'm not gonna be the lead person here anymore. And just you know, do what you're best at, just like know who you are is really what I'm trying to say. Know who you are and do the role that will net you the most money and profit and enjoyment in life. And then the other thing I wanted to point out here is the organizational model has the, li the listing side of the deal and the buy side of the deal as separate individuals. So they're, like one of the questions you're going to want to find out from any team that you're interviewing with is, am I allowed to work with buyers and or sellers as I choose? Or, you know, you might be interviewed for a listing agent position or a buyer agent position. So it's just really good to know and knowing what you want to do and what the team wants you to do. That'll be a huge consideration whether or not that team is a good fit for you. Originally, when I wrote this presentation, I didn't even have my path on here because I didn't <laughs> feel like it was, uh, I don't know, I just didn't feel like you necessarily needed it, but I think maybe it does give a little bit of context to the experience I've had being on, off, growing, you know, teams um, and where I've been, because when you think about where you're going, you want to figure out what problem am I solving? What is the pain point in my life right now, such that I'm even considering this? So for example, from 2004 to 2011, I was a solo agent. I had grown my business. I was doing about four and a half million, about two dozen deals. And I started to get to the point where my time was maxed out. I needed help with my transactions. So the first logical step to do was actually join KW because I knew that at KW, they, they encouraged you to have help. They wanted you to help, you know, get administrative staff. They talked about teams. And so I wanted to be around people who could help show me the way. I was, in, I was like a big fish in a small pond. I wanted to be a small fish in a big pond so I could grow my business. So I joined KW and in that first year, I hired my first assistant and I doubled my business, went to 8.6 million and 56 deals. And so this is the point which, you know, the MREA model and Matt, I would encourage you just read the book because it'll, it'll explain to you why that assistant is the first, really that first step for a growing agent. To hire you as a brand new agent would be a distraction from them and also not give you what you need, which is the training to do your job. In my experience, when I was in 2012, I hired you know, my, that first tra uh, transaction coordinator. And then towards the end of the year, I hired a showing assistant to help leverage some of that, where they just showed my buyer clients houses for me. And I hired, uh, the first one was not a great hire. She actually became an agent. And then I hired my second assistant. And that was Erin, who is my assistant now. 2012, 2014, I grew my team. <laughs> about 14 million over 70 deals a year. And I realized towards the end of that, I was like, I'm going out of my mind. And that's why Karen, I asked you when you said you wanted to take it easy or slow down, I was like, you're going into real estate. <laughs> like that's the opposite place to go. If you want well, to go 12 hours on your feet all day, every day is, I don't mean slow down as far as mentally, but physically okay. slow down. Okay. 
Well, you know what? There's what's really cool about being a real estate agent is that it isn't just desk work and it isn't just standing work. You know, we have inspections, mm -hmm. showings, paperwork, negotiations. So it's like a lot of you know, it's a very dynamic job. So that's I'm I'm excited for you because I think you'll enjoy that and not. I want to help you mix of both. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So yeah, so I realized I didn't like managing people and I had gotten so far away from what I loved, which was doing the deal, helping buyers and sellers buy and sell, and actually training agents because my standards are so high for my own knowledge and the people that I wanted to surround myself with. I was like, I'm never gonna grow a team with other agents because I don't have the time to train them in the way that I want them to be trained. So over the past six years, I dug deeper into training and developed an online training platform. So fast forward six years, I'm now back as a solo agent, focusing on production and training. And in the meantime, I joined a larger team because I didn't want the headache of managing people. I wanted to get back into production. And I saw an opportunity to go into leadership roles where I was either the sales director or the trainer of the team. I was the productivity coach for our office for two years. And you know, through all of that, I, I, that 2015 to 2020 period to me was like a college education in agent psychology because I've been studying how agents show up to this industry, how the industry portrays this industry to agents. I see all the pitfalls and you know, I, I see what works and doesn't work. So now on the other side of having joined a large team to get away from managing people and to focus, you know, have opportunities to, opportunities to train people, my business looks completely different because for eight years ago, everybody had to hire their own assistant in order to have transaction support. Now it's like a dime a dozen. You can, you know, throw a stone and you could probably hit a transaction coordinator who can help you with your deals for a flat fee. So now that I have a highly leveraged online training platform and I have the assistance of a transaction coordinator, I decided, you know what, it's time for me to go solo again. Because as a solo agent, I can have the best of everything. I, I have my assistant back as my personal assistant, and I can focus on production, and I can focus on training agents. So is there anything in that story that kind of highlights to you something that you need to be thinking about in your story, your future story? <clears throat> uh, well, I... Uh... I mean, is it is it possible that Keller Williams already has a transaction coordinator that does all the work for you? Is it possible that they already have assistance for you, even though, like, it's a pretty big place, you know? Is so there it, are transaction coordinators, yes. So um, Sarah Cadman is the one that operates out of our office. Um, which, I'm sorry, which office? Are you with KW Philly, you said? No, um, oh. I'm joining KW Collegeville under... Oh. Uh, yeah. Therese. Yeah. Any pretty much anybody, any transaction coordinator in Pennsylvania can help anybody, you know, in any office. So I don't know any transaction coordinator that doesn't help any agent in any brokerage. The one thing is as as a newer agent though, you cannot rely on them to train you to do your job. I've had transaction coordinators take my coursework to, and say, I will only hire or allow new agents to work with me if they take your course because I can't teach them their job. So they're not gonna take 100% off your plate. You're still gonna have to negotiate. You're gonna still have to know your deadlines and your contracts. And as far as assistant work goes, like there's gonna be a lot of personal stuff like database management, emails, a lot of lead generation, like you're still gonna have to take care of that. And there's a certain point at which you start to leverage getting assistance with the marketing concierge, you know, or social media support or things like that. So nothing is gonna be given to you. You're an independent contractor, and that's part of the problem with this industry, is that they don't ask you for much and they don't give you much. And I see Dennis is nodding his yeah. head. Tell me what you know, Dennis. Well, as it relates to Sarah, specifically Sarah Cadman, she's been, she's been awesome. In, in my mentorship program, Al has mostly coordinated that activity with her. This last deal that I, I have a contract that was, that's, going to settle the end of March. And so I've been working with her for my my own training and development, but she's awesome. She's, you know, I do know when our my deadlines are, but I, I can't even imagine <laughs> what I would do if I didn't have 
her as a conveyancer. So, so that's been that's been really beneficial. I think for me, the the comment that you made about there's there's a lot of resources out there, but there's not there's not a lot of pull. It's like I gotta really figure it out myself. That's been my biggest challenge. Again, mostly from a technology standpoint, and there's so much that KW offers. It's almost to the point where I don't even know where to begin. You know, just using command, and we're still Al and I are still using Dot Loop, and we're supposed to be using DocuSign, and so so that's the stuff for me that's been a challenge as a as a new agent without the mentorship program and depending on Al. I mean, I would have been forced to learn a lot of this stuff, but the the transactions I had would have been a disaster. Yeah. Um, so in the first session, and Matt, before you sign on the dotted line, I want to make sure that you watch my first session on leverage because I go through all of the pieces of your leverage puzzle. So that way it explains the different people that can support you. I guess to... I'll, I'll share it with you after. Yeah. Um, oh, okay. So one thing, I don't know about you, but to me, when I want to learn DocuSign and I go to the website, like last year learning DocuSign was the bane of my existence. It was, and command at the same time. It was, I don't even know what you're talking about. You know? So when, when I go to the website and it seems like there's no clear place to start, and I know if I have a specific question and I type the question in, chances are the video I get is not the correct one. You had that experience? <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, it's, it, it is. I don't even get that far because, yeah. I mean, I get into command and it's like, all right, this, like, where do I go? Yeah. Um, so, so, but I know in order to really build the business and be efficient with how I want to con contact with my, with my contacts, I need to do it, but it's almost too daunting to do it. So that is why, so this is, this is, why I created Agent University by Stacey, because I know that people say, go here, go there. Even our resource page has just like things that you plop into. I like to deliver the content in the order in which you need it. And just say, just do this. This is the first step. Set up your KW you know, website, set up your, you know, your app, which is essentially the same thing. Set up your buyer guide, set up your seller guide, all right, now let's you know upload your database. Now let's make the first phone call, and this is what you're going to say. Now we're going to do this, you know. So basically, I think my prospecting bootcamp for you, Dennis, might be particularly useful because because it is exactly what you're looking for, which is tell me what to do, and I'll just do that. I like that too. <laughs> you like that too. Well, I'd love to see any and all of you in my program. You know, my programs are very tactical, whereas like. We work on it week after week after week, and we have online webinar workshops like this every week to support you in your implementation. So it's not like going to a three-day uh, training and then you go away and you never have support on it again. So anyway, so that that's a plug for for working with me. Um, and, and Stacey, that's uh, that's called University Bootcamp. Uh, yeah, let me. I'll put the website in the chat. It's also going to be in the presentation which I have here. Yeah, so I have three boost boot camps. One is the prospecting boot camp, which is the one we're talking about. Another is the Pennsylvania State Contracts boot camp, which goes over the 40 contracts that you're going to most regularly use. And then the third one is working with buyers and sellers. So consulting on finances, pricing and statistics, buyer consults, buyer guides, seller consults, seller guides, and, and showings, selling the listings, the whole nine yards. So that's found on my website that I just put up there. Okay. And just uh, my interest would be really the technology stuff that we talked about, like leveraging command, setting up my database. So where I don't know where that would fit in this DocuSign and all of that. Yeah, prospecting. Okay. Yeah, contracts. Great. Yeah, contracts goes more into um, to DocuSign. There's like crossover, but mostly the prospecting ones about command. Okay. So let's talk about what's at stake in your team decision. It's time consuming to join and leave the wrong team. One of my, actually one of my students, he's, I, we had a conversation before he joined his team and it's kind of like Matt's, you know, question or concern or potential situation is like, they thought by going on a team and having a few people kind of be their partners that they would get a lot of attention. And I said to him, I was like, well, just be mindful of the fact that they're probably very busy and they might not have as much tension or time for you as, as you hope and think. And, Within, I don't know if it was six months or something, he came off the team and he's like, you know what? 
what you told me exactly was right. And I was like, what did I tell you? I didn't remember what I even had said. And he was like, I didn't you know, get the, what I needed. And this is not to knock any single team. It's just, we're not as an industry set up that way because we only make money when we do deals. You know, and as soon as you take your eye off making that, doing the next deal to help another agent, when a hundred agents need to come in the industry for, for seven to survive, you know, it's a numbers game. It's a risk to that main agent. So I position myself as the leverage for the team lead and the team agent to get the training so that you can both succeed, you know, and that, that's what my passion is. It's also, it interrupts your business. You may have those unmet expectations that may or may not have been ex promised because a lot of the times we make these decisions very quickly. Um, and because we're salespeople, we're good at talking a good game. Um, and because you're new, you might not even know the questions to ask. And that's why I put this, you know, um, webinar together. Um, it could also destabilize your relationships because it's very easy for those relationships to go south, you know, and, and then especially you're in the same office, it could get awkward. It can be confusing. You're constantly going on and off teams, looking for the right support, using to your clients and prospects. And then of course, it's just disappointing, right? Nobody likes to form a partnership. You're all excited. And then you realize this wasn't meant to be. It's kind of, it's kind of like any relationship. You start dating somebody, you like them for a while, then you really get to know each other and you break up and you have to start all over again. Are these the kind of things that you guys would like to avoid? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, no I, I'm, I, have, I have an initial choice, but I mean, he's got this area locked down and, you know, I feel like joining him and working with him would be better than competing with him right away. You know what I mean? Because he's been working this area for the last seven years. Yeah. You know. Well, yeah. I mean, well, that's where I could help make this a good choice for you without sacrificing his production by helping you get the training so he doesn't have to do it. I do want to make sure, though, that he has transaction support. I'm willing to bet, you know, as Adams said, I'm willing to bet he does if he's that successful. So consider the, the following when you're making your choice. What problem are you solving for? At every point I made a choice, it was to solve a problem. Do you guys remember what those pain points for me were in my story? You didn't have the transaction, you didn't have an assistant. Yeah, I didn't have transaction support. What else, any, any other pain points you guys remember? A lot of it was you outgrew what you were currently doing. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And you discovered more about yourself as you went and f figured out you don't like managing people. Yeah, and you know what's so funny is <laughs> like Aaron, my assistant, has been licensed for eight years now, <laughs> you know, and I trained her for two years. We were on the team together for six years and she wasn't my personal assistant. And now that we're back together, like she is my partner. I was like, I can't even call you my assistant. You are my partner. She's been in the business longer than a lot of people, many people, you know, and we're really actually excited because we're going to be offering um, a per transaction mentorship program for agents like who maybe didn't have the mentorship program opportunity or not. They don't have their team lead um, so that we can actually help people do their first deals rather than just like the way that I've set up the training, which is not quite the same as a mentor. And then as I was putting together content for today and the questions to ask, I realized that there were basically five overarching categories of consideration uh, when you're considering a team. Culture, leverage, training leadership and accountability, um, which in their mentorship is a role, lead generation and splits. So some of the problems that agents are trying to solve would be those temporary or typical struggles of a new agent. You know, you're an independent contractor. Nobody really tells you how to do it. They might say you need to join the productivity program as a requirement, which I think is the most perfect thing for them to make you do, um, because that's the only way you're going to get really that strong guidance from you. Uh, you might, your problem might be like, I just want to plug into a system that's proven. Like I'm just starting out. How do I create my business? Like, I don't want to do it from scratch. I just want to use a proven model. So maybe there's a team whose model and the way they operate their business is a good fit for you. Maybe you want mentorship, training, coaching, or leadership. You know, we have a saying that's it's not about the split, it's about the opportunity. And people, when people have a vision large enough to include other people's visions, that's a point where you can plug in. So when I joined the larger team, 
it's like his vision was larger than my vision and my vision could fit within it. And then over time, as Karen said, like our visions just no longer were in alignment for what I wanted to do because as Adam said, I learned about myself and I knew what I wanted to do. And the industry had also changed such that getting the support I needed was a lot easier without the struggles of you know being that employer even though I am technically an employer. And then, you know, you might be at the point where you're ready for transactional and marketing support. So the first struggle you'll probably encounter is the typical struggles of a new agent and feeling like, like Dennis said, like there's so much, there's so much that you could do. It's almost paralyzing as to what you should do. The next struggle that you will likely encounter is after you've hit success is the transactional and marketing support. And in between, as you're trying to figure out who you are and you want to become successful, it's like, well, how do I do it? You know? So I guess I did write them actually in retrospect in order, you know, of plugging into a system for success and then having somebody really mentorship and help you grow. So as you're thinking about yourself, what would you say, what's on your mind? Like which one seems most applicable to a problem you might be solving? Of these choices? Or, or any choices. Like if you have others that you're thinking. Well, I mean, my main concern is join the team or go solo. Um, uh, he wants 20, he, uh, I'm going 70, 30 with KW and then he wants 20% off that to join the team. I was like, is that too much? I don't know. Uh, is, is he asking too much? 20%? Is that a lot? Is that normal? Well, I'd have to know more about your deal to know if that's normal. It, it does not sound excessive usually when you join a team it's 50 50 and your split is reduced with the your, your cap is reduced with the office and you may pay it at a lower rate so it might not be straight up the you know 30 70 30. so well 70 30 goes to the brokerage and then 20 percent is an, an additional 20 percent is taken off i don't know if the 20 percent goes to him doesn't know i don't know if the 20 percent goes to the office i don't know what's in it for him uh I, I'm, I'm a teacher, so I'm only going to be doing this part time. Uh, what's more advantageous for me personally? That's my big question. Like I want the most money for, you know, obviously the least amount of work, you know, I'm already working. For you. Yeah. I'm already working for you a week. So yeah, a, a typical, like I said, a typical split is 50, 50. But instead of your cap, I don't know what your office cap is, minus 25,000, your cap would be 12,500 instead. So half of what your regular cap is. And I was paying towards my cap at a rate of 10%. So it, it's really unique. So you need to get it all written down. But I would just generally say that, you know, 100 times zero, 100% 100 of zero is nothing. 50% of 200 is 100, you know? So it's really about the opportunity and looking for what he's giving you and that's where we'll get into hey, Stacey. yeah hi uh this is Alex. i just want to comment to what he just uh referred to i i, I experienced a transition from the team to a, a solo agent and i don't know in my experience it comes down to the leads because you're 100 percent right like right so how much you know it doesn't matter the split if you're not getting any business but are you getting any deals from the team? Because if you're you're procuring the lead, your own, this is your own lead, this is your own people, and and you're just making the deals happen, then you might might as well be solo, right? Depends yeah. on your level of experience too, right? So how much is providing the team to me comes down to the leads, the quality of the leads, and how many deals are you are you you know are you getting out of them? And to Arlix's point. You know, there are some teams, so I think one of the biggest, the biggest hindrances to people's success in this industry is that it leads us to believe that we can have the freedom and the financial, you know, fortunes without, you know, the, the discipline and the habit to do the hard work. And the best thing a team can do for you is basically to act like, you know, you're in the military and be like, all right, like together we decide if we're here and you want to get to here in your business, they lay out a plan for you and you're like, yeah, that's what I want. Then just ha if having them help you execute that plan is the best thing that you could do for yourself. Because left to our own devices, a lot of people fail out because they're too entrepreneurial. They've never been their own boss 
and then they are, get attracted to doing the wrong things and they spend a lot of time doing the wrong thing. The one group I'm thinking in particular, the Quinton group, they're out of um, like the Jersey Shore. Like they're amazing at cold calling. So if you know you want to be like a cold caller and like that's how you want to build your business, well, align yourself with somebody who's going to basically be like, you got to be here at X, you know, on the phones with us doing script practice at 8 a.m. You're going to get on the phone by 8.30 and you may curse them out for the first couple months. But as soon as those checks start, start coming in because of the discipline and the habits you've been building, you know, you're, you're going to be very grateful. It's kind of like any Olympian. You think training for an Olymp you know, Olympic meet was fun for Michael Phelps? No, probably not. But he loved to do it and he wanted the results, you know. Well, I told um, my supposed team leader that well, that who might be my team leader, um, that uh, I wanted 50,000 on top of my, what I already make. I said, I want 50,000. I was like, can we do 50,000? He's like, oh, we can do 50,000 in your sleep. And I was like, oh, that's great. That's all I want, you know? I mean, you know, just to supplement my income. So, I mean, you know, <laughs> and uh, I mean, 50,000 is a lot of money. Yeah. You know, it's like double what I have now. So, I mean, if I could, you, you know. As a solo agent, that's one deal a month at $250,000 as an average sales price. So people have time to do 24 to 36 transactions alone in their, you know, by themselves without transaction support. So that's totally doable. And it's like Arlick says, aligning yourself with the right person that's going to help you get there. But essentially what you're telling me and I'm hearing from me, Matt, is that you want to plug into a system that's proven. He's clearly done something, this lead, the team lead, to dominate in the area. And you're like, I might as well join forces with him, you know. Yeah. I just want to highlight some of the typical new agent struggles and uh, like feeling lost or scattered, feeling lonely. It can be a very lonely business, when, especially when you're successful in a way, especially I guess when you're not. But it, it just seems like, you're, you're an independent contractor, so this business can get lonely whether you're, just, you're succeeding or not. Or you might think like, everybody's joining a team, that's the thing you do. You wanna join a team so you can see how a team is run. Anybody feeling like this is them right now? And whether you're, if you wanna, Dennis, you're, which one do you most identify with, Dennis? I, I guess a, maybe a little bit of it, uh, a little bit of uh, feeling lost or scattered, a little bit of number two, uh, and a little bit of number four. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and part of it, I get like I am very clear that that it's up to me. So, you know, so I'm not like being a victim of it. But uh, <laughs> and the reason I and really the reason I'm here maybe is probably more for uh, number four. And you know, because there's a lot of teams at KW Philly. I I you know I don't know really where to start and what the benefit is and you know if i even set up a partnership with with um al allen so that's that's probably the biggest have any of you taken the program called bold yeah i did yeah. so do you remember and arlix probably remembers this it was the plane metaphor basically so the plane does anybody remember the plane metaphor where it's basically like to break through the sound barrier it like shakes and it feels like it's going to come apart and then you break through the sound barrier and they were saying basically your business, right before you have a breakthrough, it's gonna feel like everything is falling apart. So in a way, you need to have a mess. In a way, your business kind of needs to feel like a mess because you're doing so much work that suddenly you impose a system on it so that you can get to the next level. So you've been meet, let's say you've been meeting people, you've been gathering phone numbers and this, that, the other thing, and you're like, all right, enough. I have phone numbers in my phone in this program on this piece of paper and they're all over. I need to take a Saturday or Sunday and just consolidate it and put it in a system. And then you're like, okay, now I have a database of 300 people in a spreadsheet. What can I do with it? Oh, I could upload it to command and now I can apply two different smart plans to it. But for the fact that you have to set up some of the things <laughs> to do the smart plans. But so you basically have a mess that you then see the order that you can impose on it. So I bring this up to say is that the last thing I would like to see you do is make a decision because you're feeling lost or scattered or you're lonely or everybody's doing it. And even to the last point, 
being on a team is not necessarily the best way to see how a team should be run. I think that when you develop yourself as, an, as a good solid solo agent, and then you start to bring in the leverage pieces that are gonna help you be the most efficient, you know, with that transaction support first, then marketing support, then maybe partnership with another agent, maybe only as a showing agent to start, you know, um, not necessarily even as a buyer's agent. Like, I love what you're saying, Dennis, about having an informal partnership with Al. There's no reason why you need to have those people formally on your team. But so basically, you know, go from the beginning from my first workshop, see those leverage pieces, maximize your own efficiency and your effort and your ability to do a great job. And then you kind of see where the chaos comes. Then you impose a system on it. And I think the next step will just become clear to you. Rather than subject yourself to maybe somebody else, like somebody else's leadership, which may not be the right model for you. You know, it may, I just don't think it's necessarily the best way to, to go about learning how to run it. Does that make sense? Definitely. Yeah. And I think for me, when I think about it, like, I feel like I'm at a point where, you know, like you've talked about it a few times on all of these calls of like, you know, you're in the productivity program, you hear all of the ways of things that you can do and, you know, whatever, where I'm like, I feel like I have a good idea of, you know, how things should work and, you know, like the ideal scenario of, you know, this is how you do this and this, this and that. But then I think just like part of that transition and getting that experience and learning what works best for me and, you know, kind of planning out how I want it to go for me. That's where I'm kind of struggling with the, I guess, primarily number one of like feeling lost or scattered or in, you know, like not knowing if I'm heading in the right direction for where, you know, or not knowing where I want my trajectory to go. Yeah. So I have a, <laughs> a, an ebook that I put together, the 10 ways the real estate industry fails agents. And the reason why you feel lost, scattered or lonely is because the industry has set you up to feel lost, scattered and lonely. It's just the nature of the independent contractor status and the fear that people have in telling independent contractors what to do. So the reason that like Arlix is one of my long-term students, I have another long-term student who's like, I'm gonna stay with you till I'm number one, you know, because they know I care when you're with me, you're not alone and it's over time, you know, and I'm not afraid to tell you what to do. <laughs> you don't have to do it, but I'm not afraid to tell you what I think you ought to do. Um, so. Yes, she's not afraid. <laughs> okay, so when you're thinking about the different problems that you're solving and plugging into the system, you might be looking for credibility in the marketplace, like Matt said, or getting leads, like Arlick said, or you might want to master a proven lead gen model. So that's kind of when I was referencing the Quinton group. If you really want to master that kind of lead generation, you go with the team that is going to show you how to do that. You know, you obviously don't want to go to a team that has a primary method of lead gen that is completely antithesis to what you want, how you want to build your business. I will though say and encourage you to try the different ways of all of lead generation before you say, oh, I don't do door knocking. I mean, obviously right now in COVID, there are certain things that you might not want to do, but before you say, I don't want to do open houses, I don't want to do door knocking, I don't want to do cold calling, just try it first because there are people that love to do a certain thing that they never thought that they would. And it's to Adam's point before, learn yourself. You gotta learn, you gotta do it and learn yourself as you're doing it. Just a question on on the, the get leads. I, I guess, I mean, it, it sounds like that would be a, a great benefit of a team. And I wonder how, what, how regular that is, right? That you really would get decent leads. I think for me that the, the the thing that I'm interested in is how do I leverage? I have a really big database. I mean, you know, contacts. I have, I have seven siblings. I've got 25 nephews and nieces. I've got a infrastructure from college friends and all that. So it, that's really where I, I don't, I don't need to go get leads like dialing for dollars or anything. But it's just really getting the word out about me. So that's one thing that I'm interested in. And then the other is. I live in I live at, at Fifth and Spruce, and like my neighbor's house just settled. The guy across the street just listed. The one on the corner just listed. Two doors down. So it's like, and I don't I I don't I know some of these people. Some of them already have real estate connections, but it's sort of like, you know, it literally is the half a dozen um, homes between Fifth and Sixth on Spruce Street that have sold or or are on the market right now, and it's kind of like. 
what do I need to do to get to be at least in the in the ball game for that? So every agent needs to focus on two kinds of leads. It's basically people you know already, who already know you, like you, trust you, would use you and refer you, who have high trust of you, but low statistical need. Only one in 10 people need to move every year. But 100% of the for sale by owners, or at least 80% of the for sale by owners want to sell. You know, some are just seeing what they could get and may not want to move, but only if they get their number. So you need to focus on people that already know you, but have low need for you. And you need to focus on people who don't know you, so low trust, but have a mm -hmm. high statistical need. So people who are going to open houses are highly, more highly motivated to buy that year, or maybe they're, list, they're sellers that are interviewing for their agent, they're secret shopping you, you know, um, or for sale by owners are expired. Those people don't trust you yet, and they have a high need. So you're gonna be competing for those people so you have to get really good and strategic about competing with people you don't yet know who have a high need for you. And you need to nurture the people that you already know. And nobody's going to compete with, you know, for that group as a whole with you. But you have to nurture them. And there's a, a natural life cycle of an agent, an agent's career, which is usually it starts out buyer heavy, unless you're very strategic in terms of going after seller leads or, you know, converting seller people. And then, you know, five years in, you start to start getting more and more sellers because your buyers are now selling their properties. Mm -hmm. And as you get more entrenched in your life activities and in your neighborhood, you're going to start naturally meeting seller people who will know you and then trust you as a listing agent. So when I started, I was living in Northern Liberties. Most of my friends were moving to Fishtown. So I helped a lot of buyers in Fishtown. And I started to help sellers in Northern Liberties because that's where I was being a neighbor. Yeah, you know? yeah. Okay, that all makes sense. Is that part of your prospecting boot camp? Yes, yep. <laughs> yeah. Good, all she, right. My daughter-in-law just, I don't know if I, you can't probably can't even see them, but they're little door hangers. Oh, okay. That's hard to see. Them, but, yeah. They're little door hangers that you put on a knob. It says, I'm not just a real estate agent. I'm also your neighbor. Call me, let's get your home. So she's making those for me so we can do them in the neighborhood here. You're like, we're neighbors, but get out of here. <laughs> Let me say yeah. that. <laughs> neighbors, leave, please. So, okay, so it's 158. We have 32 minutes left. All right. So another problem you might be solving is you want mentorship, training, coaching, or leadership. So, you know, some of the benefits of the team are having direct leadership and masterminding with a group of people who've been there, done that, who really have a financial investment in your success. Um, and then also friendly competition with your teammates. Um, you might have like some teams might have competitions. So you might ask if you're interviewing, you know, you know, what kind of do you have a little do you have inner team competitions or intra team competitions? You know, how do you do you ever have games or, you know, prizes, things like that to incentivize us to compete? Because it's always fun to do that. Having a mentor, trainer, coach or leader on the team will help you build good habits and learn the business from the start rather than flounder to failure. Now, I, I would say teams of any size might have this gap in their ability to train you as thoroughly as, as you need to be trained. Um, but certainly, if you interview right and you figure out like, let, you, should, you should shadow them for a day. Shadow their, you know, that team leader. Shadow their lead agent. See what they do for a day. If they're just flying by the seat of their pants, you might not want to model that. But if they are very methodical about how they build their business, that would be somebody worth modeling after. If you're already in the business, it, you know, going to a team might actually help you break bad habits or help you fine tune your skills to get to the next level. Because agents who have been successful in the business, usually it's because of their entrepreneurial spirit, willingness to get it done. And yet there are probably gaps in their skills that because they have a context for their job, to absorb new information. And maybe they've always just had a great success converting open house clients to buyer clients, but they've never done a buyer consult, you know, um, and maybe there's a, a fear of being formal with their friends. So they now need to learn how to actually become the professional agent to their friends uh, and not sacrifice service because there's a, you know, an internal doubt that they have. Um, and then also, again, you know, in this category, you might be looking to align yourself with somebody who has goals that are bigger than your own goals. Uh, and again, they're financially invested in your success. So one of the problems that you might be solving is you're ready for transactional and marketing support. So 
by joining a team, you are getting that transactional support, uh, potentially social media support, marketing support, without the risk of hiring your own staff and paying for marketing on your own. You're going to pay more for your team for that support when you're on a team than if you paid for it if you hired somebody. And that's because the person who's paying those staff, they're taking the risk, not you. So that might be one benefit of joining a team is that you are not taking the risk of having fixed costs and somebody on staff, no matter what level of production you do. Well, now, uh, um, I have fixed costs. I was told I would have fixed costs still. We all do. Yes, we all do. But you don't have a thirty dollars or $60,000 salary to pay. So if you're joining a team that is has staff on their team, aside from transactional support, like a transaction coordinator, you could pay 400 bucks per transaction. But if you join a team that has staff, that's a salary that they're paying that you don't have to pay. You pay for it as you go. The team lead is paying for it no matter what, or they fire the person and disband the team. Um, another problem that you might be solving if let's say you're already in the business, you're successful, and you just wanna leverage the marketing support, you're doing what I did was I just wanted to produce. I didn't wanna build an organization. I had the epiphany that the MREA talks as if we all should be rainmakers, leaders of a team, of a large team. And I was like, wait, no, I don't want to do that. You know, I'd just rather be lean, mean, and you know, solo, um, or be on a team that's going to help me be that, you know, be that platform for me to hit higher goals. So those were like just brief overviews of the four different, you know, problems that you're solving. All right. So we talked, there were five categories. So culture was one of the categories when you're interviewing with a team that you want to consider. You know, culture is so hard to define. We talk about it a lot at KW. So I even looked it up just to get <laughs> something here. It was basically the customs and achievement of a particular group. You know, so asking, you know, even knowing the schedule of the team calls, the meetings and other events will help you understand how the team engages with each other. Finding out what agents have joined the team and left the team in the last three years. Trying to interview them, find out what caused them to join, what caused them to leave. What's the median tenure of the agent on the team? Like you talk to uh, one of the largest teams in our office, he's got agents on the team like decades or more, you know, like the, there's a reason why people stick around. It would be nice to know what your typical tenure is of an agent. You know, and what does that team, what, is, what does that team lead say is their ideal team member? You know, what is their standard for your production, your attitude, behavior, and schedule? So if they're not thinking about you and they're writing what we call a missing persons report where they're writing their ideal agent that would join the team, we'll find out what they're looking for and figure out, well, do I match that? You know, what am I looking for? But what are they looking for? Because it has to be like a hand in glove. It can't be, you know, it has to be a mutual fit. Leverage. All right. So this is hugely important because literally the first hire in the MREA and in reality is leverage, you know, that strong admin support. So if it's, an, if it's a busy agent just trying to pass off excessive, hard to convert lead, that would be a red flag to me. They better offer you support. How, what, what do you mean by support and how do I know if it's hard to convert leads or not? So if they are sign calls, Zillow calls, buyer, you know, if, 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 I, get, if I pay for Zillow leads, those people are trying to stay anonymous yet they will click, get information, get information. So they've basically given out their information. Zillow's now selling it to 10 different agents, let's say, and this person is d desperately trying to protect their information and ignore you because they don't want to meet you yet. So if the agent is like, how about hundreds of leads that are coming in? I don't have time for them. It's probably because they're like a 2% conversion. So if they don't have somebody dealing with your deals, you know, their transaction support, and it's just the excess leads, then that would might not be a good recipe. So because admin support is so easy to get per deal, the, lead, the team also has to have something more than just admin support. It has to be more than just transactions, and it has to be more than these hard to convert leads. You know, like, like it involves that training and mentorship, training you to really excel in an area um, or that the opportunities to shadow, like a real partnership. I, I was talking to a team down in Nashville and the first year, new agent, they hired like two agents out of a hundred they interviewed. 
they actually gave them stipends and they didn't do any deals on their own for the first year. They were glued to the hip of a, a senior agent. Now, everybody gets in this business because they want to do it their own way. You know, they want to make the big bucks. They don't want to pay anybody else. But those people are actually going to learn their job. You know, they were selected carefully for fit. And now they they're not worried about not paying the rent or for food because they've got some money coming in. And now they can really focus on learning the business. You know, that's all to say is like, you have to really understand what is being offered to you and what it is you need. And I think some of the first in our series of three sessions will speak to that. But yeah, and what kind of support is offered? Is it the transaction coordination? Is it marketing, like marketing your listings? Is it social media? You know, are they providing branded listing and buyer guides? You know, if somebody, you know, a, a team lead says, I have a proven model of doing buyer and seller consults and converting them into clients and getting the paperwork signed and getting them listed, getting them sold, getting the buyers into few houses and making decisions, like that is a gold star for me. If they don't even have a codified process of how they convert buyers and sellers, well then they're still acting very entrepreneurially. And you're not really gonna learn much from that. You're gonna see them in action. It's kind of like watching, you know, like going swimming with Michael Phelps is not gonna make you a better swimmer. Having his coach tell you how to improve your stroke is going to help you be better. And if you're Michael Phelps, you probably don't have time to look over in the next lane to tell you how to be better. So you need that third party whose job it is to help you be better, unless he's going to really be that person for you and with you. The division of labor is really important. So what are you doing yourself? Because certain jobs to do for individual agents on a team are not scalable. So when I was on the team, managing my database leads and keeping it organized, like even though we have command, I still have my addresses and contacts in five different places. One is my dialer, one is command, one is for my card system, another is for my postcard system. You know, so nobody's managing that but me as a team agent. You know, and then also in the past year, I was doing more and more social media that was for my agent training business. Mm -hmm. And as well for me personally, not necessarily just about my listings, that I wasn't getting the value out of the team to do my social media, you know, because our, our paths were just diverging. So you want to know as a team agent, what is being handled for you and what are you going to be doing because it's not scalable for the team to do it for agents. And then again, go back to that first session and say, is there somebody I can actually hire to do this? So for example, we have this person called marketing concierge, Aaron, who can actually help put together branded buyer and seller guides for you. You know, you could go to the redstore.com and buy branded stationery and folders. Any questions about this section? Uh, I don't have a question. I just, I need to drop off. Okay. But, uh, I'll, I'm going to shoot you an email. I'd love to connect with you about either the prospecting boot camp or whatever you yeah. think is going to be best. Yes. Excellent. Put 1130 on your calendar for Friday. That's when we have our workshop. Okay. And I'll connect All right. you Thank you so much. Thanks, Dennis. Um, all right, so training, uh, training leadership and accountability. When you are interviewing a team, what should you be looking for? You want to find out about their onboarding process and ongoing accountability. It is my firm belief that if you, you know, invite an agent to be part of your team, knowing that they want to grow their business, and you want them to grow because you don't want them to be dead weight on your business, you want them to grow. If you don't provide that ongoing accountability, training, and support to help you grow, they are not doing you a good service. And sometimes coaching, let's say you told me, I wanna make 100 contacts this week because I know that that's gonna help me grow my business. And then you come to me the following week and you didn't get an appointment with anybody and you didn't make your contacts. Well, it might be a little bit uncomfortable for me to ask you, you know, what got in the way? Well, I decided I want, you know, I had this opportunity to go skiing with a friend because it snowed, you know? So it's like, we're gonna have a conversation about that. So if, if somebody's not, going to help you grow, which is uncomfortable. You know, remember that chaos, out of that chaos comes a breakthrough. You know, they're not doing you any service, good service if they're not challenging you to be better and do better. You might ask, am I gonna be paired with a mentor? Like, is there somebody that you're gonna go shadow? I would also ask, is the team owner doing deals day to day? Are they engaging? Or is there somebody else that's in charge of the day to day? Ask yourself, are you coachable? And this kind of ties back to what I was just saying. You know, are there bad habits that you want to break uh, or do you want to be challenged to grow the most that you can in this business? And if so, you know, if, if you'd want that and they'll do that for you, how will they do that?
And then again, is the team option the only way? Because again, we've got that org chart where you're at the center, where there's like, you know, a whole bunch of people that you could be leveraging outside of that. Is there anybody that's kind of like, these are the things that they're thinking about right now that are really attractive to them to join a team? I'm thinking I could try it out. And if I don't like it, I could leave, you know? Yeah. I, I mean, I was told by other people to make sure I have an exit strategy. So to have an exit strategy, apparently you have to write it into your contract. So it benefits you if you, at any point you want to leave the team. Yeah. Well, our, the KW model is my listings, my, or my, you know, my listing, my lead. So essentially if you leave with an active listing, you should be able to take that with you. And that's company culture. Any pending deal that you have should, you know, stay with the team at that split. Um, but just keep that in mind. Now in the lead generation category, you know, remember in the org chart that I showed you earlier, the MREA has it buyers on the one side and sellers on the other side. So you want to find out how is this team structured? Do they allow you to work with sellers and buyers, renters and landlords, or does each agent have a specialty? And you may prefer, hey, I just want to work with buyers, or hey, I just, I just want to work with sellers, or you know, I want to do rentals. So whatever you want to do, you just want to make sure the team that you're talking to allows you to do what you want to do. And again, does the team, uh, do the team agent generate their own leads or the, does the team provide some, any, or all? Um, you know, I believe it's imperative that an agent learns how to generate their own leads, you know, and, an, and a team could be supplemental to that in really teaching you a skill where you're not naturally good at. Um, and you can learn that skill and leverage their platform for that. Um, or if like they have an amazing online presence where those leads are more convertible, then great. But I would not solely rely on a team to generate leads for you because that's the fastest way to get into victim mentality. And then that'll only lead to disappointment. And then you'll have to leave the team because you're mad, they're mad, and it creates awkward conversations and relationships. You'll want to ask, you know, what's the strongest lead generation strategy on that team? And what's the second one? Again, so if, if people are using multiple strategies and you want to know who you should follow or learn from, knowing what the team structure is like is helpful. Um, and also, if they're all like expired for sale by on cold call, and you're like, I really want to master open houses and this other thing, and social media, let's say, well, maybe that's not the best fit because you're not learning from them how to do that the best. Or alternately, I'm going to kind of say also, maybe they're looking for you to lead up a division and they'll support you in getting the resources and the tools so that you can be the master in that lead generation strategy. So that's another question you might want to ask. And then again, are you expected to learn a certain kind of lead generation strategy or will they help you master the one of your choice? And again, is there a less expensive option to refining your activities and skills. If it's not clear, there are good reasons to join a team, and I believe there are not good reasons to join a team. And the reason I put this question at the end of every section, is there a less expensive option, is because when you join that team, it's it's very time consuming, again, to join and leave. You know, there's the, the time, the money, the marketplace confusion, the relationships, there's so much at stake, just cavalierly going on a team and then off a team without really having considered the whole of the decision. Lastly, splits. So you want to know specifically, you know, what are the splits? Who pays for signs, cards, printing, business cards? Um, is, there an, is there an opportunity to increase split based on production? Some teams are set up that way. Um, some teams even have a profit share plan. So that, if it's a solo agent that's hiring their first buyer's agent or first agent agent on their team, probably not. But a larger team, you want to find that out. And then you want to ask, and this is more of a consideration thing than a question, but it's like, are you an employee or an independent contractor in terms of your compensation and accountability? So an employee tends to receive many highly convertible leads in the specific lead generation activity and a lot of training in that area, but lower splits. So if you're looking at the MREA model and you see the lead listing agent, I can pretty much guarantee you that that person got to be the lead listing agent because they highly specialize in a certain activity that got them focused there and that that team is probably replicating that success and because they're offering you let's say 100 highly convertible leads you're going to get paid less per deal because of the volume and then conversely if you're expected if you're expected to generate your own leads and do it in the manner that 
you want to do, you know, of your choosing, you tend to have a higher split. So it's really a matter of you get what you pay for and you'll, you'll get more of a, you'll get a higher split of a lower volume. So you might end up making the same amount of money. It's just like, where would you personally excel? So if you've excelled in environments where there's a high level of accountability and motivation, you know, and teamwork, you might really thrive in that very highly specialized role on a team where you have lower splits, but more convertible leads. All right, we are coming towards the end. So I just wanted to remind you, you know, and this is kind of a throwback from week, session one, where of all the people that can be supportive of you in your business, between your lender, broker training, your title guy, your insurance gal, you can hire people for marketing. You can have me as do the agent mentor um, for per transaction. You can have a conveyancer, which is that transaction coordinator, agent you training boot camps and productivity coach. So like you'd have as a solo agent, you have access to all of these people. As a team agent, you want to make sure as many of these roles is filled on the team as possible so that you can figure out whether it would be better for you to basically create your resource structure or get it in one team for the most part. What are your thoughts on kind of now seeing this chart with regard to how we were talking about teams? Well, I mean, I, I wonder what, I mean, getting into a team with only me and the lead uh, agent would be, I don't know where he would be getting all these uh, attachments. Like, yeah, it, it, is it in the brokerage? Do, do we reach out into the brokerage and they sure. have all these people waiting for us? So ask him, does he have a conveyancer? Does he have a transaction coordinator? I would just ask, do you have a transaction coordinator? And the best option for you might be what Dennis has set up where he works with, he worked with somebody highly skilled for three deals where that agent helped them along with the three deals. They got a split of each of those three deals and you hired the transaction coordinator. So now you have somebody doing the administrative part of your work and an agent to walk you through doing the paperwork, negotiating the deal, you know, and, and the job of a real estate agent. So that might be a way to test out that relationship. Um, for example, when I was building my team before I joined the larger team, the one agent on my team ended up, we parted ways. And then I ended up partnering with four different solo agents in the office that I thought were really great agents. And I partnered with them per deal. They weren't on my team, but I conveyed the deal. I basically did the buyer consult, signed the paperwork. They showed the properties. I got them under contract. They went to inspections, but I negotiated inspections and I did the contract to close. So we didn't have a formal relationship. So that way, when I decided to get on the team, the larger team, um, there was no like messy, you know, entanglements that I had to disentangle. So you might try that. Do like I'm a, I'm a big fan of ad hoc relationships to start, you know, to test things out. Any other I've done a little bit of that so far? What's that, Adam? Uh, I said I've done a little bit of that so far as, you know, or like you were mentioning before with being like a showing assistant or showing agent, you know, like I've gone in and done and shadowed people either with showings and, you know, done showings for other agents before and then, you know, in return, it's like, "Hey, I'm doing a buyer consult. Sit in on it." And, you know, like anything like that, but you know, the ad hoc, more casual arrangement, you know, it's kind of allows me to see how some other agents work and, you know, things that I like, things that I don't like and where I want to yeah. make my way go. I, I am a huge fan of that because, um, you know, we talk about in the MREA book, you know, 80% of your business should be built on models. 20% should be built on creativity. You know, there are so many ways. One of the greatest things about our business is there are so many ways to be successful in it that there's so many ways to be successful at it and so many ways to do a really bad job, but seem like we're doing a good job. So by the ad hoc, you really get to see up close and personal the actual job somebody's doing rather than having a conversation like an interview. You know, first dates don't always tell the whole story. When, inter when you know, employers are interviewing people, those interviews don't necessarily represent how that person is going to show up on the job, you know, day one, day 10, day 90, day 365. Yeah. So again, where are you considering joining a team? What makes sense for you? Yeah. So that's my training website. 
this is the transaction mentorship program, which you can review. And then again, if you ever, if you did sign up for the two places where I get credit for sending people AM cards or Lindsay from Cutco and Mojo Sales, just let them know I sent you. And this is a reminder, my, my two favorite charities are the food pantry where I volunteer and also host for hospitals, especially since we're in housing, it's such a good, good resource, you know, to connect our clients with and connect people who are visiting the city. All right, I'd love to hear some ahas and peop and what what you're gonna do with information for your business. So that's really the most important thing. Um, I think it's really great, especially, I mean, like you said, the technology and you know, like what the brokerages offer has changed so much in the last few years that, you know, like when you first started, you know, you didn't have a lot of the options that we do now with doing the per transaction coordination or like the marketing concierge like you were talking about you know like there are a lot more options to get some of the benefits of being part of a team without necessarily committing to a team and wow. i really like uh, throughout this presentation you know you're kind of like emphasizing you know let's make sure that we're joining a team for the right reasons and not just to like fix a temporary issue yeah Oh my gosh, I couldn't have said it any better, Adam. <laughs> and I will say, back in the day before showing time, it literally would take all day to schedule showings. Like, people would have us pick up keys in their office, and we had to call 10 different phone numbers to get 10 different houses to show. It was a big nightmare. The technology is such a blessing and a curse, but I cannot even tell you. I was gonna say, there's still a little bit of that, like, a when I was doing a couple of rentals, there were some like management companies that yeah. were like, oh, we only hold the keys in the office. Oh, but make sure you have them back right after the appointment because I need yeah. them for somebody else. And I'm like, so you want me to go from Queen Village to the Northeast and back and show the place in a half hour, great. You know what that tells me? <laughs> they don't want you to rent that apartment. They want their own agents to do it. Yeah. So awesome. All right, who else has an aha? or something they'll use this information for. And I'd love to hear from anybody, in addition to the people I can see, but anybody who's just been listening in. I, I came to this, uh, I signed up for this because of the title, because it's like, I was literally thinking about exactly that, and then I saw that pop up, and I was like, oh, look at that. I guess Google's listening to me. Um, <laughs> it totally is. <laughs> like, oh, maybe you want to sign up for this. I was like, okay, yeah, I guess I do. Yeah. Um, so I was just looking for some conviction and, you know, some, you know, talking out what I was thinking. And I think for a part-time agent who's starting off, such as myself, um, I think the safer bet would be to join a team. And I was just hoping to, you know, work out some of the details and make sure that I wasn't getting screwed over, you know? Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, I'm, I'm still going to join the team, but yeah. I think I have more questions and better questions to ask um and i'm probably just more prepared than i was before the program that i'm watching now awesome that's really good that was definitely my intention anybody else would like to share and of course karen i'd love to hear from you since you're visual uh, i'm just eager to get started i i'm in that uh, lost and confused stage um i think joining a team now would be something i might think about consider later but I think to start out with, um, I have pretty good marketing. I have the support of my husband, who's an author who knows how to market. So he is being very resourceful and helping me make sure that I get everything I can that's successful, that he has proven to him to be successful. So I think that maybe down the road, a team would be good, but I don't think right away. Yeah, that's awesome. Anybody who is not visual would like to give us an aha. I'd love to hear from any of the three of you. I had looked into joining a team a couple of times. Um, both times they put me through personality tests. I had to do the KPA in one instance, and I think I did the DISC profile in the other one. And uh, the DISC profile, I couldn't come up with a result initially. I had to edit my responses in order to get a real result, huh. which probably wasn't the right thing to do. Um, the KPA actually said I was more suited to be a solo agent than a than a team member, nice. so that was interesting. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so uh, I mean, 
I wanted to come on to this one because I missed the first two, even though I wasn't really aspiring for a team. Yeah. On the flip side of the coin, our office here, we're in uh, across the river from Harrisburg, right, central PA. Mm -hmm. And our office has since December, November, somewhere in that time frame, added a team leader coach and um, um, productivity coach, two, two different guys now. Yeah. Uh, that I've joined into the productivity coaching mentorship thing. It's not, it's not really a mentorship thing. It's a training, yeah. pro, it's a coaching program. It's been very, very good. I, I'm not at the point of getting any business yet, but, uh, but the, the, I mean, I feel like I'm just being immersed in trainings and all kinds of stuff. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. Yeah. So it's been very good for, for Keller Williams. I've been with Keller Williams for three years, but I've been working a full-time job for the first two right up until October. So this is really the first time I've been acting like a, a full-time agent. Got it. And it's been really good, good things. Kind of like Adam's situation where it's like, suddenly you find yourself, oh, I can go full-time. Still got to put food on the table, but. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yep. So, all right, everybody. Thank you so much for coming today. And I will talk to you next time. Thanks, Stacey. Thanks, You're welcome. Bye-bye. All right. Bye. bye. bye.